Hello there, and welcome to another in a series of interviews with some of the great legends of professional wrestling, brought to you by High Spots. With us today is a 2009 inductee into the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame in upstate New York. He's a man who's won championships on four different continents, and his career spanned almost the entire half of the second half of the 20th century. More than that, though, he was recognized by his peers for his skills and abilities in the ring that thrilled, entertained, and maybe at times aggravated a generation of fans. We're talking about Mark Lewin. Mark, thank you for being with us here to talk a little bit about your career and your perspectives on wrestling as you know it. My pleasure. I guess maybe the first thing to talk about, the biggest change in the business, is the fact that we are sitting here actually talking in a relatively open manner about your career. That's something that when you broke into the business in 1953 was strictly taboo, was it not? Well, uh, yes, uh, there was no, no such thing as like a dressing room interviews or locker interviews. or There was just uh, segments in the show that we were uh, allowed like two minutes to uh, maybe challenge and all of that, but uh, people weren't really... Uh, the intrigue of the, of the dressing room was uh, strictly uh, uh, you didn't know. They never got involved in the, uh, the back room, so to speak. It's probably impossible to keep a secret <coughs> in these days with cell phones and cameras and the internet and so forth. Has wrestling lost something from that time to when things were... The mystique. Were, like, the mystique, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's lost that uh, perspective. I don't say that it's a bad thing, you know, like uh, these are modern times and uh, like we're more connected, the <laughs> internet, we're... You know, it's a great thing, and, and the uh, the avenues are open. I can't say that uh, I'm not guilty of the crime of uh, letting people uh, m more into the business. Um, I, uh, I think it's a, a good thing in a way, yeah. Um, let's go back to the beginning. You are originally from Buffalo. Correct. One of three wrestling brothers. Mm -hmm. uh, talk a little bit about growing up in post-war Buffalo, in the early 50s when it was still a thriving town? Well, uh, like I, my uh, brother came out of the Marine Corps and uh, he used to drag my brother Ted and I out of bed at uh, 5 o'clock in the morning to run in uh, Delaware Park and uh, snowdrifts, you know, like he was uh, cracking down on us, you know, and then the uh, Ed Don George was the promoter there, former world's champion. Uh, Maybe some people still remember Ed Don George, and he was the promoter there. And he was uh, interested in my brother Don because he had a little boxing ability when he was in the Marine Corps. Don was the oldest of the three. He's the oldest. He's uh, actually uh, uh, 11 years older than me, and then my brother Ted's two years older than me. I was the youngest, so everybody's always picking on me. The, the baby of the not family. For, not for long. <laughs> you know, so anyway... Uh, he broke into the wrestling business, and my sister uh, married a uh, pro wrestler, Danny McShane, who uh, actually trained me along with that Don George there in Buffalo. Uh, you know, the business was a lot different then. You know, the the training was uh, you were you were put into a pit and dragged around and knocked around, and it was, wasn't easy to get into the wrestling business. Did you have an athletic background in school? Did you play football or anything like oh, that? Oh yeah, well, I played uh, for Lafayette High there and oh. uh, AAU wrestling, and I had, you know, I weightlifting and swimming. Uh, I was all around athlete, a runner. Now you talked about Danny McShane. Maybe we should uh, digress on Danny for a while. When was the first time you saw Danny, and do you remember your first impressions of this guy who was? a world light heavyweight champion and maybe one of the dominant wrestlers of the mid 20th century. Well, Danny McShane, uh, when I first saw him, uh, he wrestled the great Togo in there in uh, the Memorial Auditorium in Buffalo, New York. And uh, I, I saw him strut into the ring and look both ways. And he was dangerous, Danny McShane. You know, I just, I just fell in love with him. He was, uh, he was everything to me. Danny broke me into the business, and 
and brought me uh, to California where I lied about my age to get a, a wrestling license out there. And uh, Gorgeous George was on the spot at the time and uh, he had trained me uh, while he was in Buffalo there and then married my sister, like I said. And uh, Danny had, uh, he put his heart into every, every single moment of being the heel of the walk. When he went into a department store, you know, he, he used to um, go and look at a pair of pants and if they were cheap pants, he used to rip the crotch out of them, you know. I mean, he was a real heel of the business in and out of the ring. But you couldn't take your eyes off him. No, he had that, uh, he just had that magnetism about him that uh, you wanted to watch him and watch him and watch him. And especially if, when I went to California, he had a, uh, a series of matches with uh, Wild Red Berry, and they were uh, enormous matches, and they were blood filled, and people would just, it was a sellout situation with him. Uh, you see, uh, I was in the business sometimes, I used to go to territories that uh, didn't have TV. <laughs> So we used to barnstorm them, like almost like uh, uh, maybe there'd be hardly any people there, and then uh, by word of mouth, you know, walking the streets. I mean, it was just a different uh, uh, carny type, uh, and there was a lot of a lot of uh, wrestlers that uh, that. Um, weren't so easy to get along with, especially being a young guy, you know, they wanted to stretch me and uh, make, make sure I paid my dues in the wrestling business, which uh, I guess uh, it continued on through the, uh, the 50s there for a while, you know, that, that type of, uh, you know, like Amarillo was uh, uh, promoted by the name of Doc Sarpolis. He was, uh, he was an amateur wrestler himself and then in uh, you went to different territories and they were all uh, uh, wanting to be the toughest guys in the world. So it was, wasn't an easy business then. Okay. Well, you talked about going to California mm -hmm. and, and lying about your age. I guess you were actually like 16. That's correct. But yeah. you claimed to be... I guess I was 18. Claimed to, claim to be a real gray beard instead. Yeah, or, yeah, something like that. Yeah. But uh, tell us about, well, first of all, what was your parents' reaction when you went to California? I was so crazy about wrestling. I was drop kicking in the backyard. I was drop kicking on the cement. I was letting people throw me through uh, through trees. I mean, I was just wrestling. It was my my whole life. I was just raised in it. I mean, my brother had already uh, went to Ohio and was uh, starting to wrestle around Buddy Rogers. And he worked for your brother. Worked for Al Haft at that Al time. Al Haft, yeah, yeah, Al Haft Acre there in Columbus, Ohio. And, uh, that was a great territory for wrestling. And the, the great Scott, I can, so many wrestlers in, in that territory. It was big at the time. It was Ohio and uh, uh, West Virginia and, and all through that. And that was a driving type uh, situation there. You know, you drive from town to town. So you were kind of almost doing backyard wrestling when you were a, a teenager. Oh yeah, oh yeah. From the, from the time I was that high or right on up, you know, I was, just crazy about wrestling, and uh, I uh, I had quite a natural physique, you know, and mm -hmm. and uh, I'm, I I was a great swimmer and a great uh, I just loved uh, everything to do with uh, wrestling. So the, when I came home after school, I was wrestling, you know. How big were your eyes? How big did your eyes get the first time you went to California, the young kid from Buffalo in the company of uh, the gorgeous Georges and the Buddy Rogers of the world? Well, he told me, uh, Danny told me, uh, after he'd run me down in the ring for a half hour, and I was, he told me, look, uh, you're going to wrestle uh, Wee Willie Davis. Well, this Wee Willie Davis was about... Uh, nine feet tall in my eyes at the time and a 320 pound guy and he said he doesn't like young guys and he says he's going to break your arm what do you what do you feel like I said well I can't say no because I want to be a wrestler you know? 
that that was huh. my my attitude. You know, I was willing to take the lumps. Yeah. Um, you started off in in California. Uh-huh. Worked a little bit in the the Midwest. I get you were still by most records here, 17 years old when you were working places like Chicago and Rochester, Minnesota and facing people like George Bolas. How, how intimidated were you to face, for example, a zebra kid who probably outweighed you at that point by maybe 100, 150 pounds and was probably 20 years your senior and was a terrific amateur wrestler too? Oh yeah. George used to go into uh the colleges and wrestled the whole team, you know, and one one afternoon he was he was a great wrestler, you know, and I remember uh, I was wrestling for uh, Fred Kohler in uh, Chicago when uh, Jim Barnett and him were there, uh, they had the uh, Chicago network there, uh, I don't know how many states they were going into at the time, and uh, uh, Buddy Rogers was wrestling. Uh, the name slips me, but he was wrestling somebody, and he broke his jaw. Uh, uh, Cashy or somebody, I can't remember who it was, but it was somebody's son at the time. I know. Uh, and uh, might have been Al Cashy. It could have been Cashy. His dad was it, that, King Kong. That, yeah, that is, that seems to be the. Can't remember, but anyway, he broke his jaw, and uh, everybody was all excited and everything. So I was wrestling uh, next with. Uh, the zebra kid, so I said, oh, he broke his jaw, he broke his jaw, what's going to happen to me in this thing? Well, I, I couldn't have been 220 pounds at the time, but don't get me wrong, I was in pretty good shape. I always kept myself, you know, in pretty good shape, no matter what my what my schedule was. So I, I got in the ring there, and uh, I was really hyper, really nervous, you know, and they made the announcements, and I can remember my ears were going long, you know, like Homer Simpson when the teacher's talking, you know, <laughs> they don't know what they're saying. And I was all out of breath and everything, and all of a sudden I I realized I was I was going through the air, and I, I drop-kicked him, and he went over the top rope and out onto the floor and sprawled out on the chairs and was laying there like that. And he, he was in shock himself, and he jumped up, and he got... A, into back up into the ring like he was good. and I ran and I had scissors and then they heard this 380 pound guy flipped over the ropes and I jumped up again I started drop kicking him and he was he was too uh, I mean it was just uh, the, the crowd went crazy and that and I wrestled him for 60 minutes there and, and it was a, it was a, one of the, uh, the most talked about matches across the country you know it's just phenomenal it, it sort of made my, my career one of the things that made me. Yeah. And one of the things we should mention is that that wasn't one of those deals where you guys sat down and worked out a skit in advance. Oh, plot there was by no, plot. This there is was something nothing, you just did on your own. There was nothing. I, I didn't know George Bolas. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I knew he was a zebra kid and all that, but I mean, I, it wasn't a thing that I was riding in the car with uh, George Bolas. It was uh, an impossible thing in, in those days to... Uh, the camaraderie wasn't there. <clears throat> like uh, things change. Uh, things change in the wrestling business. Obviously, yeah. Now, one of the uh, many guises you worked under in California. This was around 1955. Was somebody called Skippy Jackson? Uh, a lot of us always thought Skippy Jackson sounded like he should be the vice president of an East Coast fraternity or something like that. How did that? name come about and was that an actual persona? Well I think that was uh, uh, Buddy Rogers uh, because uh, he had wrestled my brother Don. Uh, I think that uh, they th- thought uh, maybe a different name mm-hmm. would uh, and then there was uh, the Skippy Peanut Butter at the time. <laughs> so that's Skippy Jackson. Yeah, that's how at that, that point though being, being young and, and old enough to shave, but not by a whole lot, mm. it probably would have been impossible for you to be other, anything other than a good-looking, young, baby face, to use one of the wrestling terms at that point. Uh-huh. That's correct. That's what uh, Vince McMahon used to call me, the best baby he ever had. Yeah. Is he? Yeah. Um, talk the, late, the late, the, the yes. late one. Yeah. 
Vince Senior, oh, yeah. Vince J, but Vince Senior. Yeah. Talk a little bit about Buddy Rogers because uh, he was as dominant a figure as there was in wrestling for so many years. One of the great heels, if not the greatest heel of all time, one of the greatest workers of all time. Correct. What would you pick up as a young guy just kind of watching a Rogers match? He had the uh, natural ability, let's put it like that. He had natural ability. But he, uh, he was a, a, a cunning, he's a very cunning person, you know. He, uh, I spent a lot of time around Buddy Rogers and, and Danny McShane, a lot of time, and uh, uh, I tried to pick up their good habits, you know. That's He had a, uh, a great way of talking, you know, like he used to say, you know, Daddy, I'm the greatest guy in the world, and you can believe in me. Well, you could not believe in Buddy, you know what I mean. <laughs> but he had that way of sucking you in, you know, like he, he was... Uh, he had that gangster type uh, uh, dress and uh, a little Sinatra like. Yeah, yeah, that's t that you got it. Yeah, that's that that's very correct about him. Where Danny McShane was uh, a country type, uh, rough cut, you know, but very very intelligent too, and a and a movie star. You know, he was in in quite a few movies and that, yeah, Danny, I, I, I learned the good things from them, you know, uh, and maybe some of the bad things too, you know. Oh, it is Buddy after all, yes. <laughs> yeah. I can't say that, uh, I was a good guy completely in my, my, uh, my life, but, uh, in that era I was a good guy, yeah. yeah. Your brother Ted has said in a couple of places, working with Danny, Danny could deliver a punch that looked like it was going to take your head off. No. But you wouldn't even feel it. No. Light as a feather. Was that your experience working with him when you were 16, 17, 18 years old? Oh, he was a master. He was a master of his craft, yeah. He used to uh, hang a plate and punch a plate. That's how he he's perfected his punch. Is that so? Yes. Him and Dizzy Davis, uh, they were the... Uh, they were the best. Uh, I think uh, that's t uh, one of the traits uh, where I really learned how to throw punches, and that was through uh, Danny McShane. You know. That's really important to the credibility of wrestling, isn't it? I mean, a punch has to look like it's a punch because we see so many things when you began and even now where the punches you know, look like something they're cut out of a movie clip. Yeah. Well, one thing... Uh, about wrestlers, uh, uh, I'm not not being. Uh, you know, most wrestlers have one way of falling down and one way of getting up. This is not necessarily a good thing. You know, they have some guys like to trip and fall or get run over to the top rope and get slammed off and then. That that there is their their little routine, but uh, if if you watch uh, my matches, and uh, this is my ego talking now, you'll never see me get up the same way. You'll never see me talk the same way. You'll never see me roll up my sleeve the same way. You'll never see me touch my face. You'll never see an interview that's the same. You have to be creative. You know, and that's when uh, I met uh, Jim Barnett. He 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 let me be creative. You know, to I mean, it's easy to think of things and to create create different per personalities, which you'll see now on TV. Now, I'm not criticizing any success here. Don't get me wrong, but the, sometimes I look at it like, well, that's a poor imitation. You know, like. Uh, 
but anyway, that's that's none of my business these days. But 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 it is in my heart still part of you know. I love the wrestling business no matter what. I mean, God, what have I done? What what? Who's done more than me? I mean, maybe uh, I don't know who's done more than me in the wrestling business. I mean, I'd I'd have to think hard to say who's done everything that I've done in the wrestling business, inside and out. You know, I I think that uh, it's given me a complete uh, complete happiness in every way, and. Uh, that brings up my uh, my my present wife, uh, Singaporean uh, uh, girl, uh, and uh, she's uh, from a royal family. She's a princess, and uh, I met her in Singapore, which through the wrestling. And uh, they say her beauty is what made the north wind blow. So I'm oh. I'm completely uh, I'm completely happy, you know. Uh, it's brought me everything wrestling. So, but getting back to the point of falling down one way and getting up one way, this is a this is a thing I'd like to tell the wrestlers of the day. Try to be more creative. You know, do things that I mean they're flying. Don't get me wrong, but then there's that that thing of uh, the male image. You know the Bring that into it, where you, you have a personality that people want to see you all the time and believe. I wrestled in places week after week, week after week, and did business week after week. It wasn't a thing where it was a big promotion and everybody got behind it, you know. I was drawing week after week in the same place. People used to come to see these matches because they they were interesting and and they uh, they were close to home with them. You know, I had people who got to know you. They got that that feeling. Well, he lives in our hometown. You know, like every every city in the world is my hometown. You know, that's the way. Isn't it important, though, especially when you were younger in your career and and, and a good guy, or a baby face? Yes. How how did you learn or develop the ability to show that you were taking a fearsome beating, which we generally call selling? Was that something that came natural to you, or was it something that was developed, or how how did you develop the ear for knowing when to? fly across the top rope as opposed to just kind of staggering in the corner? Uh, a lot of people imitate what I uh, what I used to do in that respect. Yes, I, I see it all the time. Uh, uh, a couple of them that uh, imitated that uh, would be like uh, Dusty Rhodes. I would say that he had that uh, selling ability. Uh, few, you know, uh, that uh, captured that kind of uh, uh, Angelo Mosca Jr. I remember one time uh, he was talking to me and he said, "God, I like to like to like to do something uh, uh, that would uh, make the people." really feel uh, sorry for me. I said, well, always think about uh, a dog choking on a bone. You know how they yeah. rive and wither and, you know. And then you can get that feeling of... Uh, and then you have to have a, a feeling. I had a feeling for quite a few wrestlers that I liked and I wanted to see them on top. So I would... Uh, get down for them, you know what I mean, in, in every respect, so, and a lot of them owe me a lot of, a lot of favors like that, you know, because I would put myself uh, into a position of writhing uh, to make them, to make them a star, you know, so Did, was there's got to be a feeling to it. Was there a point where, in your experience, 
as a good guy where you could writhe, but if you showed too much pain, you ran the risk of starting to get the fans riled up around ringside. I went causing... overboard with him, guilty of the crime. Did you? Yes, I did. I really went over. I remember Buddy Rogers saying to me one time, oh, my God, you're going to get me killed, you know? So I said to him, well, uh, maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> 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 Buddy and I, you know... We're, we're from way back, like I say, a lot of these guys were from way back, so... Um, he was, uh... He, uh, had great timing. Carl Cox was the guy that, uh... that uh, I uh, brought over, and, uh... I made him before he even got there, you know, I just, Because uh, I liked him, you know, I liked the guy. In talking about being a, a good guy, the, the first real good long run of your career came in New York Correct. with the famous All Buffalo tag team right. with Don Curtis and Mark Lewin. Correct. The greatest tag team ever to come out of Buffalo for sure and Correct. this, this Correct. year honored into the uh, into the Hall of Fame <laughs> in upstate you. New York. That. How uh, how did I'm sure you knew Don originally from Buffalo in some way yeah, shape or form. How I, did that team come about? Well I, I saw Don when I was was a kid. He's, he, he's a bit older than me, uh, 10, 12 years older than me. I saw Don. Uh, I was I was wrestling out there at the University of Buffalo, and uh, Luthez happened to show out there. You know, I was training out there, and uh, Luthez happened to show up out there, and he was uh, uh, going to wrestle some of the. And Don was wrestling for the UB there, and that's how I met him through. Uh, Danny McShane and Luthez there, and I just met him briefly and watched him wrestle, and he did real well. And uh, I remember they were blowing the whistle all the time when Thez was uh, hooking them, you know. And, you know. <laughs> How did the team get together in uh, in what was the old Capital Sports promotion? Well, uh, that's the history of uh, Vince McMahon Sr. Yeah, uh, he was, uh, there was Bobby Davis and uh, Dr. Jerry Graham and uh, myself. Uh, uh, Vince had uh, Capital uh, Wrestling there and uh, he had the TV show, but there was a bunch of promoters there. Uh, Cola Coriani, uh, Toots Mont. Of them, and they're gone. I guess for most of them, and and I was wrestling actually for Cola uh, Coriani, but uh, Dr. Jerry said, uh, "Why don't you uh, get dressed?" And uh, I wasn't doing very good at the time there. It's uh, like split up promotions and that. He said, uh, "There's this." Uh, guy that has uh, Capital Wrestling down there and uh, Bobby and I are gonna go with him, you know, so to speak. This is when you were you were talking with Dr. Jerry. This is this is Dr. Jerry. This is when you were down in the Baltimore area. Yeah, I was I was living actually in Brooklyn at the time and uh, wrestling uh, like for Cor Cola Coriani around that 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 part of the thing. They had a little TV show there too mm -hmm. in in New York. I can't wasn't so little, but anyway. <clears throat> so uh, Vince McMahon, uh, I went down there, I put a suit on, and he said that he had uh, been managing uh, Ricky Starr, and that wasn't uh, developing so good that Ricky was, uh, he was uh, doing ballet or something, and Vince was unhappy to, with him somehow. He was managing him, and... I guess they weren't cutting up some money or so. I, I don't I don't remember that. This is vague to me, but so uh, he had the TV, and uh, I think at the time uh, he didn't maybe uh, he was doing something with a newspaper or something. I can't remember his whole. This is a long time ago, my man. This, this is the winter of fifty eight, fifty nine, right around. Yeah, there. this is a long time ago. It's the winter of fifty, maybe fifty seven. Who knows? Yeah. We're going way back. Back, yeah, or earlier. I'm not sure. 
So uh, he said, uh, we said to him that, uh, you got the TV, so we joined together there. Don't get me wrong, he was, he knew he was, he knew he was Vince McMahon, there's no doubt about that. So uh, it was Dr. Jerry and uh, Bobby and I that uh, we uh, we went with Vince McMahon and the other people went by the wayside, you know. He, he took over, uh, I wrestled Skull Murphy there the first week uh, on TV and then uh, 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 he lined him up for me and uh, he made me there and uh, Dr. Jerry and I, we went on uh, and he brought in uh, Eddie Graham, which Eddie, and I was, uh, at that time I was uh, still with uh, Argentina Rocca as a partner and uh, Perez. You know they were going ethnic at the time. Every every, sh every single show they were going ethnic and oh, yeah. Rock and we were, Perez were at the top every yeah, time. Yeah, and for years I followed that. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, Vince McMahon, if he he wanted you to be a a star, he you were a star, and that was a great hook up there and a great time. And thanks. Thanks for many great uh, meals at Goldie Ahern's. Thank you, Mr. McMahon, wherever you are. <laughs> so anyway, that was that was uh, that's how the and uh, Eddie uh, came to me and said uh, there was this uh, wrestler from Buffalo that was in Amarillo and uh, is uh, uh, Don Beidelman, who is Don Curtis. And, I said, well, I, I know him, yeah. So he said he'd like to, to bring him there. I said, well, sure, does he need some money to get here, you know? So that's how Don uh, came to uh, New York. At first, he uh, was still uh, doing a lot of single matches there, and I was with uh, Rocca as a partner, like I say, and uh, that as that weaned out, Don teamed up with me uh, permanently there for uh, uh, quite a uh, I don't know how many years, three, four years, I guess. Can you can you talk a little bit about or just describe the wrestling scene in New York at that time? It was just red hot. You've mentioned some of the names. Oh. Madison, 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 Madison Square Garden, 20,000 every time. Uh, automatically it was sold out, yeah, automatically. Did, had he, McMahon, had, had he tapped into just uh, something that nobody had tapped into before? Or was it just the, the level of talent? Because the names there are just... They're all Hall of Fame names. Yeah, well, uh, Rocca and uh, Harry Lewis, his manager there, uh, uh, he was, uh, I guess you could say that he was kind of a freak of nature. He, This guy could jump up in the air and split and all that. I, I can't say some of the things I that he did, but he made up for it. Uh, You know, like he, we used to lock arms from the, from the rear, you know, and he'd jump and squat with me from the rear. It's not an easy thing to do. Oh, wow. I mean, he had some, he used to jump rope and triple it up. And I mean, he was just, uh, he was Tony Rocca to me. He was a great guy and uh, he did some things I didn't like, like, but uh, I mean, in his, uh, in his, uh, uh, Outside the ring, so to speak. No, no, yeah. no, no. Inside the ring, he did some things I didn't like, like he used to. That didn't look right to me, mm -hmm. but he used to jump on guys' shoulders that were seven feet tall and bring them over. So he had a lot of good. He had a lot of good. Uh, he was a soccer player, you know. Yeah, he was not trained as a wrestler with holds and maneuvers. And no, that sort that's of thing. what I'm getting at. Yeah, but okay. he didn't have some classic things that he did, and he was a great athlete. Don't get me wrong, but he wasn't. Uh, he wasn't in that wrestling scene, you know. He wasn't with the Tony Morellis and uh, guys that. Uh, don't get me wrong. I wasn't the toughest guy in the world, but I I went through tough times to get uh, in the wrestling. 
And at that time, you were still just a kid, really, compared yeah. to 22, 23 years old, maybe. You mentioned Dr. Jerry Graham. Now, no discussion of wrestling on this planet or perhaps any other planet is complete without talking about Dr. Jerry Graham. That's correct. The Jekyll and Hyde that was Dr. Jerry Graham. That's correct. But the, the, talk about the good side, at least for now. As a psychologist in the ring, how was he? Pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. He had uh, he had his portfolio. Let's put it like that. He uh, Jerry was the kind of guy, though. You know, like he had room service in in, in his room, and uh, I said, "Well, I'm going down to eat. Well, I'll go with you and eat." You know what I mean? Like uh, Dr. Jerry. Well, he loved to eat and drink, you know. And was it showing at that time? Because early in early in his career, Doctor Jerry wrestled your brother Don, and there's pictures of them. And Doctor Jerry looked about like you do right now, yeah, which is correct, correct. felt and and in oh, shape. Oh yeah, correct, correct. Like I say, he got out of hand with his. Uh, he liked to be amused in every way, you know. So he. <laughs> I, I don't know how to put that, but he he was uh, he got out there too far. Doctor Jerry went, uh, but uh, thanks to him and uh, and Bobby and uh, to Vince McMahon. I mean that's what you know, that's what sent me on my way. How did you and Don wrestle just about every night of the week? All right, all over New York and, oh, yeah. and the whole territory. How did you keep it fresh for so long? A lot of tag teams will be together for six months, maybe eight months, then they're out the door because it's getting stale. I like uh, I was the best baby Vince McMahon had. I was a uh, hundred percent baby face, you know. Like uh, I. Uh, the announcer's name and. Uh, it, uh, I can't think of his name there in uh, uh, the Voice of America. But anyway, uh, I brought him some brownies from my mother, you know, and uh, you know, from that part on, they were sending me brownies, you know, <laughs> like, uh, and, I, and I was. Uh, I, my, when I took Don in as my partner, I was faithful to him, you know. I, I was my brother's keeper as far as uh, Don Curtis was concerned. Uh, I, I took good care of Don. Um, were you using the sleeper hold at that time as your finisher? Yes. We have Actually, I've... Judo Jack Terry is the one that uh, taught me the sleeper hold. I, I should bring him up, you know. Oh, absolutely. The... Uh... Buddy Colt said one time, and this is applicable to the beginning of your career and the end of your career, that Buddy Colt, an opponent in Florida, watched the way you worked in the ring. And you would work the throat and the jaw area throughout the entire match. And then you'd apply the sleeper. Right. And then people would say to themselves ringside, aha, that's why he was working the throat area and the neck and the head. He was, he was softening him up for the sleeper. Was that actually the way you would think in the ring? Uh, you know, I could have put... Yeah, I could apply the sleeper hole from, from any position, you know. When I say any position, a guy could be running, uh, like tackling me off the ropes, and that used to be a, a, a favorite way of of mine of hooking the sleeper hold. I mean, some people they talk about using the sleeper hold, and uh, I actually used to demonstrate it uh, many times on TV, openly to fans. We used to we used to bring them to ringside and knock them out. And you'd be surprised, even women used to run up there to get put in sleep, you know. So I, I, one was down there in, uh, in Georgia, uh, this guy on the, the TV there, I think it was in Augusta, I'm not sure. 
he came up and he said, I really want you to put me to sleep while I was talking, you know, on an interview. So uh, I said, sure, you know, I said, but first of all, have you been drinking, you know, because he was a bit wild looking. It's because if you've been drinking, I don't, I don't want to put you out, you know, because I had a, uh, a bad experience there in uh, Singapore putting on, uh, there was an Indian festival there, you know, and and uh, I had a lot of Indian friends there, and one Indian friend of mine came up and put me to sleep for everybody here. There was, there's about 15, 20,000 people there, you know, so I, I was playing the Indian music up there, and they stopped and everything, I knocked this guy out, and boy, I had, I'm telling you, they said, you killed a man here today, you've killed a man here today, what have you done, you know, and I, they were all surrounding me, I said, my God, here, here I am at this Hindu festival, and I can't wake this guy up. I was, you know, so my friend Meha, he, he jumped in there and he, he twisted his neck somehow and I don't know, this guy came to me. <laughs> so this is, yeah, so yeah, I had a sleeper hold. Uh, then there was, uh, so anyway, I put this guy to sleep and uh, when I woke him up, he said, wow, what a trip, I want to go out all the time, you know. <laughs> how did I guess you, it was the error, right? How, uh, how did Jack Terry show you that? I mean, how was... I guess, how does one show one the sleeper hold? Which well, is, he used to I'm, let me put him out. I'm, he well, used to let me put him out and, and cut off, uh, cut him off all the time, you know. Uh, I, 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 went, I did a little promotion down there in Australia and I put a bunch of people out uh, recently, a few years back, and, and uh, it help, helped, uh, helped the, uh, the promotion, yeah. So anybody that likes to uh, likes uh, to, to go to sleep sometime, they can. Uh, they're having uh, insomnia. I'm I'm willing to put them to, <laughs> to sleep. If anybody doubts the sleeper hold, you know. There's probably some skeptics out there, but that's probably why it was important for you to actually yeah, demonstrate that, that it on was, TV. Yeah, that was the idea of uh, yeah. And uh, Jim Barnett, he let me uh, there, and uh, he let me uh, put him to sleep. I'd like to say hello to Jim if he's out there. Yeah. Jim is Jim is always looking down on us from somewhere, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, toward the end of your time in New York, you and Curtis started fighting the good guys as opposed to the bad guys for a little while. Was that by design or was that just for a change of pace? Um, or had you run out of opponents after three, four years together? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know that uh, era there that we, we were with uh, Atlas uh, yeah, as a manager. Uh, I, I don't think that was a long-lasting thing. I think that was uh, uh, Eddie. Uh, Eddie was going down to Florida. He was uh, splitting up with uh, Dr. Jerry, and uh, he re reportedly Eddie has said Eddie said in his lifetime many times that three years of Dr. Jerry was like. 30 years with anybody else. Oh, I bet, I bet. You know, well, I was with Dr. Jerry a lot longer than him, so I I saw Dr. Jerry do some strange things, man. strange things. I can't uh, I can't tell you right here on the air, but he did some, you know. <laughs> now, we're, Boy, we're, 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 we're not triple uh, X-rated. Right? I, I could just trip back on him, wow, huh? Excuse me. We're we're not triple X rated for Dr. Uh, yeah, we're not triple X rated. He just uh, wow. <laughs> he lived life to the fullest. That's for sure. Um, you went to after New York. You went to Indianapolis and that uh, whole area where Barnett was right. had a thriving promotion out there. Now that was when you were wrestling more singles than you were in New York. Mm. Again, was that by design, or were you interested in just establishing yourself more as a singles wrestler there? Well, I think I when I when uh, I left uh, New York there, I did a couple of series there with um, Buddy Rogers, and uh, then I went. I, went, I think I went up to. Uh, I think I went up to Calgary. I think that's where. Uh, is that correct? 
Very good. Yeah, excellent I, memory. Uh, okay, I think I went up to Calgary there, and uh, that was quite uh, quite successful for me. Uh, that was with Stu Hart, and uh, they were all growing up then, the little little hearts, you know, and. Uh, <laughs> um, they had a tough time getting into the wrestling business. It wasn't easy for them with Stu, you know, like he was always, he was another one that liked to demonstrate holds to spectators, you know. Did you ever go down in Stu's little uh, gymnasium he had in his basement there? Was no. that the? No, I was, it wasn't necessary. It wasn't necessary at all. He, uh, I remember one time I, I came into a room and there was this guy on the floor and Stu Hart had him twisted. <laughs> I don't know, he had him smothered and twisted and I don't know what he was doing to him. But the guy was purple, you know, and I said, uh, Stu, uh, what is wrong with you? What are you doing here? And he said, that, well, this guy, uh, he was out of line with me, you know. So I said, well, I, I have to get you off of him one way or the other. No. <laughs> so anyway, he let him go. But Stu had a... It was Stu Hart. You know, that, that was it. Uh, that was his uh, thing. Now, there was a famous wrestling review cover in 1963. He had a picture of you on the cover. And it was to the effect of, has, has Mark Lewin turned into a maniac? Or words to that effect. Um, because that was around the time, and I think it, it might have been in Texas for Garibaldi or it might have been somewhere else, where you started deviating from the all-American, clean-cut yeah. persona that you'd had before. Yeah. Again, was that something that you'd kind of worked out on your own? Or what was, what was the impetus for the, the maniac well, at that time there was uh, when I went to Texas. There, I I'd been in Texas uh, when I left California when I was very young. I was a short period of time there for. Uh... By the way, Elvis used to. Uh, you know, you know. I, can I break away from that? Yeah, please do. Yeah, Elvis used to play the uh, in the Sportatorium there in Dallas in between the uh, matches. You know. Uh, yeah. So, of course, he wasn't uh, famous then, but he used to play there at the Sportatorium between the matches, and they, and they I remember uh, they, they had his, later on in the years, I used to go up in the office there, and, and they had the, his first, uh, first uh, check that he had cashed, you know, for $25, you know. Oh, really? Yeah, so, he was uh, just a kid then, you know, yeah, yeah, so that just, just thought about Elvis there for a minute. You know? No, but no, that's it's a uh, it's amazing the crossover personalities have gone from TV and wrestling and Hollywood and yeah, back yeah, and forth yeah. again. You mentioned Danny yeah. McShane had been in movies, yeah. for example. Yeah. Were you ever were you ever just as an aside ever tempted to do that kind of thing, the movie thing or the? Uh, yeah, there was a they they came to me there in Hollywood uh, to do a, f a few movies, a friend a friendly persuasion there with uh, Gary Cooper. It was this guy, uh, Russell Quirk, I think his name was. Or he, uh, uh, Tab Hunter, he, uh, because I was I was doing so well in wrestling at the time, wrestling Gorgeous George and that, you know. Uh, there's been a few, uh, and then uh, uh, there was uh, a few times uh, I turned down a couple of movies, but uh, there's a few I'd done, you know, and then. Uh, King Curtis, he did a few there out there with, uh, you know, Jules Strombo was out there in California there, and he used to get us skits in the movie all the time. And a lot of, lot of the movie stars used to come around in those days, you know. Yeah, Cary Grant used to come around all the time, and Gregory Peck, and there was a lot of them that used to come around, you know. Um. Let's get back to the maniac thing. So, oh, yeah. yeah. How, how did the maniac... That Paul Bosch, I guess. You know, Paul was... Uh, Paul was working there for uh, Morris Siegel and uh, Frank Burke. They were the promoters there in Texas at the time. And they were 
that was a place that everybody wanted to wrestle. It was a hotbed for wrestling at the time. And, and I got in there and uh, there was uh, Rita Romero and Blackie Guzman and, oh. Oh, Ricky Starr was there at the same time. Ricky Starr. But he, he wasn't I mean, doing the ballet thing then, was he? No, Ricky, uh, Danny McShane was wrestling Ricky Starr there, and yeah, and he wasn't doing the ballet thing there. A little bit. No, I, I, I take that back. No, he was doing the ballet thing. And uh, there was just so many. Uh, so I was wrestling in, uh, in Houston, and they had booked me in, uh, in, a, in a match where I was wrestling uh, scientifically with a guy, you know, and something just tripped in my mind. I said, I just, I just, this thing is not uh, going where I want it to go, you know, and I saw they had K. Bell and them, all of these people, Samson, K. Bell, <laughs> all these, there was all the same types, you know, including myself, you know, I said, I'm gonna end this, and um, hence the maniac. I spun the guy around and low blowed him and they didn't expect it from me and some chairs come throwing through the ring and I remember Bull Curry ran down to come help me get out of there. <laughs> you know, the people were jumping over the ropes and, the, you know, yeah, it was a uh, bedlam and, and they said uh, they put on there uh, uh, the picture of me as a is this a baby face or is this a maniac? You know, Paul Bosch was pretty clever like that. Had you ever thought to that time about being a heel? Because you, you'd been a good guy for a long time. No, I, I think it just came automatically, you know. Uh, I think I was a, a heel in many respects uh, anyway, you know. So it, was, it came kind of naturally. There's a little heel in all of us, isn't there? Yeah, there is. That's true. You know, some people bluff that it's not there. You know, about the, it's there. Yeah, only he is great. You know. Was it easier being a heel or a baby face? Very natural for me. <laughs> yeah, it was very natural for me, and uh, but I, I drifted in and out of different personalities. You know, like I lived every personality. The purple haze. You you might say I. I lived uh, as the Purple Haze for quite a few years before I became the Purple Haze. But that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> um, talk about the first time you went to Australia. This was in the mid-60s. Um, mm. Had you done any touring of Japan or the Far East then, or was this... Uh... No, I think that uh, uh, I was wrestling in uh, San Francisco uh, Roy Shires out there, you know. I was there before for the Mushniks uh, in in the early fifties with uh, with Brother Don, and uh, uh, Roy Shires. Uh, oh yeah, Killer Buddy Austin was there, you know, and he was going over to wrestle for Jim Barnett in uh, Australia. Him and uh, Johnny Doyle had gotten television there uh, with the Packers the uh, on Channel 5. We should say that Barnett had sold the promotion in the Midwest and then Yeah, he had sold to Detroit and went over there with his co-promoter there, Johnny Doyle. When I say co-promoter, one of, one of Jim's favorite promoters, as he put it, because he was the he was a, a tycoon then. So he went over there and he uh, threw the announcer over there, Jack Little. They, they, had, uh, they had obtained the, uh, the TV show. So. And it was just getting, they, they had brought uh, Killer Kowalski over there and, thing, and Dominic DiNucci and a few guys and uh, they were trying to get it off the, off the ground. And, and uh, prior to this, I had had a, 
a run-in with uh, uh, Mr. Barnett in uh, Chicago that wasn't uh, really favorable, something to do with, um, well, maybe I shouldn't uh, drift back to that, you know. But anyway... Whatever you're comfortable with. Well, you know, it's, I'd, I'd be naming people that I don't want to, you know, get off with, but uh, Vern was around there at the time and it wasn't uh, wasn't real favorable, And but I, I admire him, you know, he's a good guy. So anyway, uh, they were going to sue me or something anyway, uh, and it really didn't bother me, so... My name was mentioned uh, by Buddy Austin that uh, he was d doing good things with me in L.A. I had boomed L.A. Uh, there for Strongbow and uh, Eileen Eaton had had the, had the hook up there. And I said, uh, well, why, uh, why don't you bring him over to Australia? And he said, oh, Mark Lohan, please. <laughs> and he said, no, no, no. You got this guy wrong. You just never, never saw him in the right, right picture. You know, you got him wrong. Give him a try. So they brought me over there. Well, there was Mitsu Arakawa, and uh, this was uh, he was, uh, and uh, he run me into the post there and on TV and. Uh, he, he uh, Pearl Harbored me, you know, so to speak, and, uh, and my uh, he caught me over the eyebrow here, you know, and down in here. On the, there must have been a wire or something hanging out on the, the ring post there, and he cut me open right here, you know, while the blood came down, streaming down my eye, and uh, somehow I got got loose out of the wire and spun around and there was a chair there and I I remember I'd come up with my foot and I slammed it down and I had a piece of wood and I came after a, a Mitsu and I, I drove him with this thing and he got away from me, snuck out, you know, and got behind a, a door that had a, like a little window in it, you know, and they, he had that that grin on his face, you know, that was well, uh, I I can remember people saying they they couldn't get home from work because the traffic was blocked. We were selling out everywhere from coast to coast in Australia. So that's. I'm guessing Mitsu thought that was a lot funnier than you did at the time. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, that that's what the, uh, you know, from zero to capacity. So I felt pretty good about that. Uh, good for my ego. Yeah. Well, let me use this characterization. Your brother Ted characterized you one time as a rough baby face. Yeah. Is that, do you think that's a fair characterization? Yeah, it, it is because uh, I was believable. And uh, when you're believable in a contact sport, uh, you have that, uh, that roughness. Everything I did in the wrestling business, when I'm, like I said, that's that's where we come to that one way of getting up and one way of falling down. You know, I got, I put everything into uh, people want to believe, you know, believability. And I mean, there's a lot of a lot of. When you put a TV show together, a wrestling TV show together, I don't want to give anybody any uh, and they, any tips, you know, on what to do, you know, or anything like that. But you got about you have to think about well, you gotta have happiness, you gotta have sadness, you know, love, hate, you know. You, there's so many things you want to roll around in your head, you know. Like, I didn't have a hundred people helping me, uh, uh, working in my office or anything. I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with this uh, mass production type uh, atmosphere, you know, nothing wrong with it. No sarcasm in there. But uh, I didn't have all that help, you know, I, I was doing it all on my own. So. Uh, 
I, I wanted to, I wanted all of these things to be in my own character, just like if you're producing a TV show. I mean, I, I was producing and directing myself uh, along with maybe 20 other guys. So was I Mark Lewin? Or was I hazified? Or was I the maniac, you know? It just depended on which personality I wanted to get into at the time, or all of them at the same time. Mm -hmm. You see, that's what I mean. Can you put this all together? I mean, comp my brother Ted is a very, very... Let's get on to him for a second. He's a, he's a real bright guy and was a, was a good performer. I mean, it's... There, there's no doubt in my mind, but you know he took a different he took a different avenue. He uses, you know, this, he's a very bright guy. You know, I was, you know, he uh, he helped me a lot on, on not you know uh, I had that PS17 mentality, and uh, he was going to Pratt Institute, and and I was. Uh, I was doing other things, you know, and then when I, when I, when I hooked up with him there in Brooklyn, I, he said, you know, like, why don't you join Great Books and get smart, you know, instead of, uh, you're street smart, but are you, you know, you know, he did a lot for me, my brother Ted, in that respect, you know, not, not, you know, he, he showed me there's a, you know, showed me there's another way of thinking you know, that helped me too in, the, in my career, of course, you know, like. Did it broaden your horizons also to do so much international travel? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Especially on the, uh, uh, the ethnic uh, aspect of the wrestling business. You know, it really did, yeah. Australia, you know, that's a, they had a lot of different, uh, a lot of different nationalities there, you know. They have Italian, Greek. Uh, they have, uh, they have, uh, you know. So I went to. Well, uh, that used to be in New York too, you know. The, uh, they used to have, you know, like Bruno San Martino. Yeah, you know. So uh, yeah, and uh, language-wise, uh, I was always intrigued by different languages, and. Uh, you just met the princess a few a few minutes ago, and uh, she's multilingual, you know. So that uh, it helped me in business too in Asia, you know. Like I was going around doing different uh, different businesses in Asia, and it uh, it uh, it shows you the, uh, the sensitivities of uh, different people, you know, like. Uh, Maybe I should run for an office or something, you know, about how to be more sensitive uh, towards uh, towards uh, different uh, ethnic groups, you know. I don't think we want to go there. This is messy, right? <laughs> That's right. Uh, yeah. Well, there's a lot of similarities between wrestling and politics. They they both are absolutely. They are both concerned with somebody performing and manipulating a mass audience. Uh, that uh, that's right. You are a hundred percent right. You know, like. Uh, all these people are doing business too, and and in just a different, uh, just different avenues. That's correct. Um, you never really went back to New York after you finished that first run with Don Curtis. Was that by design or by accident, or was that just the way things worked out? I'm gonna be real careful how I answer this one. Like I spoken like a politician. Spoken like a politician. Yeah. I won't be the maniac on this one or the purple haze. I'm gonna be real straight. I have no idea. I remember. Uh, I remember uh, Bobby Davis said to me, uh, "How come you don't go back to New York?" And I said, "Well, I have no idea." Yeah. I have no idea how I never uh, went back. Uh, I have no idea. Uh, a lot of rumors come back to me why, and uh, 
none of them make sense to me because I remember when uh, Mr. McMahon uh, Sr. was uh, calling me and Eddie down there in Florida. He was uh, passing, you know, and uh, like he uh, was always uh, 100% saying uh, how he was always uh, his beginning there with uh, Dr. Jerry and I. It was always great to me. I have no, uh, no idea. But anyway, I survived, you know, I mean... Uh, well, you did, and in fact, you... Well, ended, yeah, I survived very well, yeah. You did, and you ended up going to Los Angeles, and yeah. you won the world championship for that territory yeah. from none other than Lou Thez, yeah. one, two, three, in the middle of the ring, and I imagine... Put him to sleep, as a matter of fact. You did, sir. and I imagine just being able to fight Lou Thez was probably something a kid could not have dreamed of, much less well, beating him. The year I was born is the year he won the heavyweight championship, so he was a legitimate uh, for I don't know how many years he held the title. 1937 is the, the year he won the title there, and here I was in the Olympic Auditorium wrestling Luthez, who, by the way, he moved like a cat. There's no one that moved any better. Yeah, he was coming over my left shoulder, you know, and I, I like that, and all of a sudden I saw he was on the other side of the ring, you know, like, uh, wow, I sl slammed this guy, and he was coming off there so fast, I don't know how I got underneath him to slam him, he was coming off so quick, he was phenomenal, you know, like, uh, I remember he was up in my room one time there at the, uh, in Detroit, and he, he ordered a, a grapefruit and two dry toast and black coffee. I said, hello, <laughs> you know. He said, well, I don't want to get any drum on me, you know. I said, well, yeah, I guess not eating that way, you know. He's, yeah, he, he watched himself. Uh, you know, him and Strangled Lewis were, were livers, the high livers, don't get me wrong. <clears throat> and they were flying them in just for... Uh, Cocktails, so to speak. Yeah, you had a real good run in Los Angeles. That yeah. was the the yeah. champion out there. Yeah, uh, I think you had Carl Cox out there. You had well, a lot of your uh, Bobo Brazil. Bobo Let's Brazil. Let's not forget Bobo on this conversation. Bobo Brazil. He was a tag team partner of mine, uh, as long or longer than anyone, uh, except for uh, maybe King Curtis. Uh, he was uh, our courtesy of Kale. Yeah. Now, one of the big matches in the 1960s that probably nobody knows about was in Seoul, South Korea, against Kentaro Oki. Uh, okay, yeah. When Oki won that championship. No, he beat me there. And, uh, uh, and uh, reports have varied over the years as to how many people, but the consensus seems to be it was about 48,000 people. Uh, at least, yeah. What was it like, even at that point, for a seasoned veteran? to be wrestling in somebody else's country in front of 48,000 people with a guy who was a legend in his own land. Well, when they brought me uh when they brought me in there they uh they uh they picked me up in a uh like a police wagon that was uh, the Marines, the Korean Marines because uh, this guy was so popular there was uh and I had made some uh, slanted interviews uh towards him and uh and uh there was fright frightened for me you know so they, they put a guard at my door and all that although the hospitality was great but from, from the Korean hospitalities the long noodles everything was great at the Tommy times, it was good. So uh, they brought me to the arena, and they they took me to, to the ring, uh, and uh, before the thing started, uh, he turned his back, and I need him in the back. So we've established who the heel is. Oh, we established it right off. I need uh, I need him in the back, and he went through the ropes there, and. Uh, I opened them up before the before the uh, bout started, you know, and the, they rioted there, and 
They took about 20 minutes to get the people under control and everything. I can remember I had to go underneath the ring because they were throwing so, so many things in there and chairs were flying and everybody got hurt but me that, you know, naturally. Was this, was this outdoors? Uh, yes, it was. I believe it was outdoors, yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah, it was outdoors, as a matter of fact. And they had all these uh, uh, geisha, you know, dressed and flowers. I mean, they was going to make a nice little nice little thing out of this, you know. Well, I spoiled uh, their whole, uh, the whole parade there, you know. And, uh, uh, and I remember uh, Charlie Moto, Mr. Moto, he... He ran down there to try to save me too, and the Marines were around me. They liked me real good, you know. And then the match finally got underway, and oh, they had to stop it a couple of times because of people were jumping in and out of the ring. I was hot as a firecracker, you know. And then uh, I turned on Bobo there uh, in the Olympic Auditorium before he came back for the rematch where I took the title back. Yeah, Bob was in another world too. He's gonna, he, I miss him, man. Bobo, it seems to me, was, was more than just a wrestler, he was an attraction. He, he was, he was, he was one attraction. of those guys who could go you from never place saw, to place. You'll never see another man uh, like Bobo Brazil. Uh, when I say that, uh, uh, there's a statue of Hercules there in Greece, you know, of, of, guy looking good, you know, Hercules. This is how uh, he had that, he had a phenomenal physique and he, he wasn't, he was natural. He was a nat, that, I don't know how he got natural physique like that. I don't know, it's just, a, I guess a, every hundred years or so a guy comes along like, uh, like Bobo Brazil. Have I put him over strong enough? <laughs> yeah. Well, well, Bobo and you, were probably the two most most frequent opponents for maybe fifteen or twenty or twenty five years yeah, of, the, of sheik, the sheik. Yeah. 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 Where did you first meet him? Because we could probably do five or six hours just on the sheik versus Mark Lewin oh, matches. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, where did you first meet him? And and well, um, he was with McMahon too. He was one of the first. Uh, he was one of the first ones that came uh, uh, along too. Uh, it, uh, after Dr. Jerry and uh, myself, then came, uh, well, and Bobby Davis, I don't want to forget him. And then came Eddie and uh, and uh, uh, Don Curtis, and then uh, the Sheik. Uh, he was uh, one of the first ones there, too. Yeah. Now, he wrestled a very different style and very different method than just about anybody at the time. The matches were frequently short and sweet and to the point yes if, and that using a double entendre the, yes he uh, by the way i also wrestled him uh uh in uh in houston for uh, paul bosch that's where i really first met him i had a drift back there i i wrestled him uh in uh, houston there and uh, uh they brought me in there passing through to wrestle him and uh that's where I really first met him. Uh, actually, I wrestled the whole week there, uh, passing through, to going to another territory, and we did real well together. Uh, yeah, but he was uh, high violence, high violence, no doubt about it. And he could throw the fire, which was, uh, he could throw the fire like nobody else. He could throw it across the ring and He could envelop you in flames. He was, he was, he was a true fireman. Yeah, how big a cousin. You had, in fact, you had. This is all at the time of the Six Day War, and there was actually at one point Mark Lewin was the Israeli champion mm. against the Sheik, who was the Arab champion. Yeah. Who says geopolitics doesn't involve itself in wrestling? <laughs> it does every day. Yeah. How did you feel? How did, how did you keep it fresh with him, Mark? You must have wrestled him 100, 200 times, maybe more over the years. Oh, yeah. Easily. Easily. Uh, like I say, that... that uh, I, I knew uh, what... Uh, 
it, you you ask about that selling thing. It was natural for me. Uh, he he was a very believable guy. He wasn't a big man. Don't get me wrong, but he he had uh, every bit of. Uh, In his young days, he had a lot of guts. Uh, in his young days, he had a lot of guts as far as uh, going the limit on uh, on violence. He had a lot of guts. To, you know, uh, he was uh, he was a natural with me, you know, and uh, we sp he, 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 we, we both spoke. To, uh, a little Arabic, you know, and it uh, it came in uh, on our personalities together and all of that. And I found him, uh, I found him a real uh, someone I could always draw with. He was always uh, he was a hundred percent in the business. Let's put it like that. Bobby Heenan said one time the Sheik didn't have to do a lot of stuff because if he had done a lot of stuff in the ring he wouldn't have been the sheik exactly he didn't he didn't have to go through all of that like i say he, he the matches were short with him not always actually i went over an hour with him which was a uh, which was a actually a classic uh yeah i don't know if you have that one down there in Cobo hall there uh, where i went to uh, uh, I finally beat the Sheik. I finally beat him, you know. The people were at the point where they wanted to see the Sheik beaten, you know. And that didn't happen very often. Not often. It was like Luthez. Uh, I remember uh, after I put him to sleep in the Olympic Auditorium there, and uh, Jules Strombo came up to me and he said, You know, Mark, uh, you could count them on, the, on one hand that have beaten Luthez. So uh, to look down at his, uh, him on the mat uh, asleep, uh, Mark Lowen had finally arrived, you know, in, in my own mind, you know, because I'd watched him as a kid in Buffalo at the Memorial Auditorium, you know, and uh, him and Strangler Lewis and Don Eagle, I could go on and on with these names about the, the past, you know. Was that one of those moments, Mark, putting Fez to sleep in, in L.A., where you kind of stood there for half a second and said, boy, <laughs> this is oh, it? Oh, yeah. I finally, uh, I said, well, it doesn't get any better than this, you know, like, uh, it was almost an unbelievable moment, you know, one that uh, I'd like to capture again sometime, you know. Maybe in the next world. Huh? That's what makes them so special, isn't it? Yeah, that's yeah. what makes them so special. Yeah. yeah, he was a special guy. I remember I was uh, on Sunset Strip with him there, and we went into a shoe shop, you know, and uh, there was a pair of these uh, ballet shoes, you know, and, and they were they was kind of pricey, you know. So he said, "Well, uh, I'll take that." Uh, this color and this color and this color, you know, he's, he's taking them all, you know. And I was thinking, God, I gotta pay for my, my hotel here on the strip, but I'll take a pair of two maybe, you know. I was fumbling around and that and then. And he said, you know, you, you gotta have good shoes. He said, my father was a shoemaker. <laughs> so I said, I better take a pair. <laughs> this guy, <low. laughs> yeah, Memories, huh? Isn't that what it's all about? Yeah. Well, that's what keeps the wrestling fans coming back, is, is people can get uh, get hooked on this stuff, yeah. Yeah, for better or for worse. Yeah. Um, let's go it to It gives you confidence, you know, wrestling. You know, when I was wrestling, when I was growing up as a kid, you know, I went to a rough school, PS 17 there, you're familiar with it, yeah. And uh, it was every day, you know. So it gives you great confidence, you know. Uh, any young people, I really, uh, I really say, get in, get in there and wrestle. You know, the, I'm, uh, a lot of these states like Washington um, and uh, Oklahoma, they got great wrestling. Uh, all these wrestling, they, they, and it's a, 
it's a it's a good thing to to be in the wrestling. It's not just then for you the physical side of it; it's the mental side yeah, of it too. Yeah, it gives you confidence and it builds character to uh, wrestle. Yeah. Talk for a minute. Let's go to uh, Australia again because you went back and forth. If they'd had frequent flyer miles in those days, you you'd probably still be flying for free. Yes. But um, one of the first real troops of wrestlers was the People's Army. Correct. In Australia, with yourself and, and King Curtis. And just maybe just ruminate for a minute about Australia and especially about Curtis, who falls into that Bobo Brazil category where he was larger than the business that he was actually in. Correct. Correct, I would say that. Well, you know, he's... Curtis is uh, from the ELKO family. Uh, in the book of why there, that family is they're in, in they're in the book. And Curtis, uh, Scott Murphy said to me, "There's this big guy in Hawaii. He played football in Canada, pro football, and he he went to Berkeley out there and." And I said, yeah, I'd, I'd seen him on uh, King's Cross. He'd come over there and wrestled for a week for King Kong, old King Kong, old King Kong. So uh, I said, yeah, I know him about him. He said, well, you're stopping through Hawaii. He wants to pick you up at the airport, you know. I was kind of forgotten, you know, a little bit about him. And when he picked me up up there, he had a big Cadillac convertible pick me up at the airport there. And, here he was, 400 and some odd pounds. He's growing since I had seen him. My God, what a man. So, um, yeah. I said, why don't you come over, uh, why don't you come over to Australia? And that was when I had a lot, lot to say about talent there with, uh, with Mr. Barnett. And uh, I brought him over there and and the People's Army, you know, uh, uh, I was walking uh, through the uh, through the people going into the arena, and they used to they used to stand uh, outside there, even in the pouring rain, you know. And uh, I was feeling the moment, and I said, "Let's lock arms, brothers, and get into the People's Army." And they all started locking arms, you know, and then I realized, I saw that they were all locking arms all the way up and down. And I, uh, I realized I had just started the People's Army, you know, because I had read in the newspaper, uh, uh, we were going to Hong Kong, and I, I read about the People's Army in uh, China. So the whole thing... <laughs> The whole thing, uh, you know, if you read the newspaper, you can get your next day's, uh, I don't give anybody any ideas out there. You know? <laughs> I won't tell them my secrets, you know, because they got their own. Yeah. What's that? People don't read newspapers anymore, no, unfortunately, so you've anymore. got the yeah. market to yourself. <laughs> well, uh, the internet, you know, it's, That's the, right. it's the avenue where it's, he deserves every dollar for the internet. <laughs> What made Curtis stand out as a performer? He was an orator. Did he talk that way in, when we're talking here? Did he talk the same way in private as he did? In <laughs> Just about, yeah. Really? He, yeah, he was. Uh, yeah, he was. Uh, he could actually. Uh, I remember they. There were. There was a plane late there, and they uh, put him on. Uh, and he was going to do an interview and. They had to kill 30 minutes, it was live, and he talked for 30 minutes, and the ratings just, I think our ratings there in Hong Kong were, uh, in Hong Kong, our ratings up there, uh, they were around 30. I, I, I don't think a figure like that's ever, I don't. I don't follow it like I I, I used to, but I, I I don't think a thirty was in. I don't know whether there was a thirty ever. You know that's how they used to. 
you know, they used to stop in the streets and watch in the sto uh, in the shops there in Hong Kong. Uh, that's how popular it was. Uh, that's what, where I created the war theme. That was my baby too. I remember uh, when I got down there in Florida, they thanked me very much because they robbed my war. I said that's okay. You know, I'll come up with something different. You know, doesn't. Uh, it doesn't take me long to be creative, you know, where uh, some people, it takes forever, you know. One way of falling down, one way of getting up, I'm back on that again, huh? One well, of the guys that you, you, you were involved with in Australia and then throughout the States for so many years was Gary Hart. Yeah, Uncle Gary, yeah. Yeah. Um, Gary is recognized, R.I.P. Gary, but he's recognized as one of the great managers of all time. That'd be correct. Did you have to guide him, or was he pretty much certain of the way things were going to go and could take it in that direction? Well, uh, Gary Hart, uh, the Sheik is uh, the old Sheik, uh, the original Sheik, I should say. He uh, he uh, had Gary Hart there, uh, and also the. Uh, uh, Another manager, I can't, uh, he's a famous one too, but I can't, he'll come to me in a minute. He, uh, when Gary wasn't doing anything there uh, much, he was uh, working a couple times a week and not doing much. And So uh, I never had a manager. I had gone strictly, uh, I had gone strictly straight in Australia, you know. Mitsu and I told you about that era. And baby Bellicola. faces usually, usually did not have managers anyway. No, but I, I didn't use them with uh, anybody else either. Mm -hmm. You know, I was uh, running the business, so I, I didn't use them, and I didn't I didn't use uh, girls. Later on, I did, of course. You know, and, but I was really uh, we'll call it old school for a uh, lack of. Uh, Another. So I, uh, I asked Gary. I said, "Look, uh, I can." He was a Playboy. That's what uh, the, she could name them there, Playboy Gary. And I said, "Look, uh, why don't, uh, why don't I bring you over to Australia?" So uh, he was so green at the time. He went over. He went around and said that. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to steal him away. I said, steal him away? <laughs> this guy's not even working, you know what I mean? So I said, well, <laughs> but anyway, I saw something in him, you know. And then he, he, he came to Australia, and uh, he brought uh, Brute Bernard and uh, Skull Murphy and uh, uh, Rip Hawk and Swede and Had somebody else, um, I think he, no. That was Big Bad John had, uh, uh, he had Brower Power and uh, Bulldog Brower and uh, who else did he have with him? A lot. Yeah. Koloff was over there at one point. Too. Koloff, yeah, Koloff was there, yeah, yeah. When, was it in Australia that you first got interested in the booking aspect of things and, and uh, Doing a little more in the front office than the the wrestling. When did, when well, that's did that where I really had. Uh, uh, he, he gave me full. He uh, he he. Uh, at first, I was doing things because uh, I wanted to make. Uh, I wanted to make the place go. You know, I mean, like with Mitzo, the first uh, thing off there. Which uh, actually, uh, the wire happened to cut me open, like I told you. Just happenstance. That just the one. That just uh, a freak thing that, that boomed it. But after that, I I, I was wanting to make uh, free things happen all the time, you know, in my own mind to to create. Uh, 
that's why I brought Gary in. That we've gotten back to that uh, manager type thing because uh, I saw Morris Code with flashlights, you know, barring people from arenas and them showing up in the audience, uh, flashing Morris Code to, you know, I just. Different uh, things that uh, I, uh, I incorporated into the wrestling business. And uh, Paul Bosch and I are the ones that originated the cage match, by the way. I wanted to get the cage match settled here because I never lost the cage match, you know. I, it was my uh, specialty in cage matches. Maybe with the Sheik, I'm not sure. I don't think he really beat me. Anyway. If he did, it was probably tainted. It was tainted. Something was wrong, yes. <laughs> something was <laughs> something was wrong in the dressing room. Yeah. Oh my God. You're bringing back a lot of memories to me, my man. I appreciate uh, I appreciate this because uh, it gives me an opportunity to express uh, some of the things that uh, I, I believe upgraded the wrestling business. You know. Yeah, it sure. Uh, I sure uh, wanted wrestlers to be driving Cadillacs, not not running five guys in a car, trying to make a town. Eating bologna in the back seat. Yeah, I I wanted to upgrade the wrestling business. I mean, maybe a lot of maybe a lot of guys out there. You say, well, Mark Lewin this, Mark Lewin that, but I surely upgraded uh, them financially. You know. Well, Gary said, and I thought this was. Uh, true, and you can comment on this, that uh, Mark Lewin would go out and put a guy over in the middle of the ring. He would go to Houston, Texas, cut his head open, you beat him one, two, three, right in the middle if Mark thought he could make money for you. Exactly. That's what I was saying. If uh, I, I felt for a guy, you, you asked me, how I could uh, do these death walks for uh, and uh, and uh, go overboard for somebody it was because I, I I thought I met some real men out there. You know what I'm saying? Some real guys like that our lifelong buddies of mine. Uh, well, we haven't talked about Kevin at all. I don't know why we haven't. He he certainly. Uh, he was raised around me. He came up with Eddie and I there down in Florida, and uh, and uh, he'll be here. So. It, well, one of the interesting things about your career is your career, as you said, ex extends from from Gorgeous George to Kevin Sullivan, mm -hmm. from uh, Buddy Rogers mm -hmm. to Bruiser Brody, yep. different styles all. Mm. Did you change over time to be able to accommodate different styles? Or did you just kind of see going with the flow was the best way to go? Well, I, I, uh, I upgraded the violence in the wrestling business. I, I, uh, I'm guilty of that. Uh, when I say I'm guilty of that, it's part of the wrestling business. I mean. That love and hate, you know, that's what really, really makes the wrestling business. I think that uh, uh, I, I changed, uh, I changed uh, my physique uh, a lot of times too, uh, which uh, helped me accommodate, you know, like. Uh, I remember one time I was real big and I was wrestling uh, Jimmy Snuka, and he said uh, to me, oh, you're, you're so big. It's, I said, well, n next uh, we were going, coming back like three months later to this, um, to Singapore, actually. And I said, well, I'll, how do you want me? You know, how do you want me to be built? You know, I'll change my physique for you. And so I just I just changed my physique from uh, 280 pounds down to about uh, 220. Where you could see everything, you know. So the change in physique was almost like an actor 
prepping for a movie part exactly. and slimming down exactly. afterwards. Exactly. Instead of makeup, I was actually doing it, you know. And I, rem I remember a guy came in to uh, uh, Ric Flair and all of them were over in, in Hawaii and uh, I think it was, uh, I forget which one of them was with Rick and he said, you're, you're, you're carving uh, your body with heavy weight. And I said, yes. You know, I mean, he just saw it, you know, and I said, yes, that's what I'm doing, you know. But you were trying to achieve a particular purpose. Yeah, I wanted to. I wanted to. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. I could change like that too. It was like a what's that thing that changes color? Chameleon. A chameleon. That's yeah. right. <laughs> they require. Hello. <laughs> they require a lot of uh, weightlifting, I'm guessing, and oh yeah, protein shakes and the whole nine oh, yards. Yeah. The, oh no. You are what you eat. You know the intake there. You know there's that. Uh, Education of a bodybuilding, you know, Arnold was out there and and uh, Joe Gold when I, they was all with me, you know what I mean? Uh, Elvis, you name it, you know, so we was all out there, you know, and I said, uh, I read the book there where he, uh, it was a shoot book, you know, he was saying how he got ready for the uh, Mr. Olympia, you know. There was the. Uh, I went to the last program in the, in the book that he that that he prepared himself, and I said, "Well, I'm gonna prepare myself." He's there was a line in there, you know, about Plato, you know, and this and that that I don't know. I don't know. Said about changing your physique, you know, in three months to you can change your physique, in a year you can change your life. So I was doing some evil things to myself, uh, and uh, evil type of my life. And I said, "Well, I, when I read that, I said, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go along with this thing. I'm gonna do this program for the year and not miss well." It was. Uh, I went straight into the program, which you shouldn't have done. You should have done a preparation going into it. But I was stubborn, you know. I went into this program for one year and never missed the workout. For one year solid, it's a six day program. On the seventh day, I still did two body parts that uh, I, I didn't want to let, uh, you know, that little bit of, you know, little water retention, you know, I didn't want that left. In. So I, I stayed on that program for a year and changed my physique completely. Sounds almost like a life-changing experience, really. Exactly. Well, I was trying to change my life at the time. I was going through some uh, bitter things, you know. And you know, we have our ups and downs, you know, and uh, our faults. And uh, I'm, I was guilty of a lot of things, doing a lot of things to myself that I shouldn't have been, you know. Everything. So I, I said, well, I'm going to straighten myself out. That's one thing I didn't, uh, I didn't, uh, I didn't, uh, I didn't have any problem doing those things, you know. I, I could uh, flip in and out, look at what a chameleon thing again, but I could flip in and out of them and take care of myself that way. Yeah. Was, was that part of the wrestling lifestyle, though, Mark, with the, those dangers and those problems you we can speak obliquely about them, but did that just come with the territory? Yeah, it was a, yeah, I think so. I, there was guys that um, never got involved, you know. I, I, there's a lot of straight guys out there, I can't say there wasn't, especially in that era. Well, the 60s, I doubt that, you know. I'd say the 60s were, uh, like Arnold says, those were crazy times, so. Um, you know, but they were, I wouldn't try. If somebody said to me, uh, Mark, would you trade any of uh, the time, uh, do it over it any differently? I'd say no. I, like Gary Hart had said, do it again. <laughs> That's what Gary said. He's in Atlanta, he's way out there, and he said, look, I, I'd do it all over again. So, uh, uh. One of the uh, great benefits of the internet these days is that fans of any age can see a 
big, strong, muscular creature arising from the waves. I think allegedly off Waikiki, but it's probably the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> and, yeah. and this was the purple haze. Uh-huh. Um, talk a little bit about how you first got involved with that character, what the thinking was behind that character with Kevin, realizing that probably most fans of a certain age don't even know Purple Haze was one of Jimi Hendrix's great psychedelic rock songs. Correct. Well, I, Dusty Rhodes. He, Dusty Rhodes. He's he uh, he saw me as the Purple Haze, you know, because he. When Dusty first got around the business, around the uh, uh, the original Sheik and I. I don't want to call him the old Sheik because that would really irritate him. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and he was around me during uh, the psychedelic days, I think, and uh, and uh, he's the one that uh, presented me with the uh, purple hay, so. It didn't. It wasn't hard for me to fall into the character of the Purple Haze because um, I am the Purple Haze, no matter how I. Uh, why would I? Uh, <laughs> why would I uh, not go uh, for the Purple Haze? Because uh, I am the Purple Haze. It was easy. How so? A little mysterious, a little out there. Well, let's face it. I am out there. I mean, no, no matter how I. How much, uh, I mean, uh, no matter how much of an athlete I've been, and, uh, and uh, you know, I'm from the Timothy Leary era, you know. Uh, enough said on that. I, 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 uh, I liked uh, living uh, on the wild side and uh, maniac. Uh, I have a way of flipping out. Uh, I will, in fact, uh, they used to call uh, uh, my my wife and I Mr. and Mrs. Flip, you know. So anyway, uh, the Purple Haze, uh, Kevin Sullivan, J.J. Dillon, uh, he had a part in that because he, he and Dusty and all of them, they filmed it. and. It got great reviews walking, uh, walking up the uh, the beach. There it was a long swim from Hawaii, <laughs> right. So, yeah. And, well, how uh, how was that? To, did you have to do more than one take on that, or were you just able to walk out and? There was one take on uh, on that, it, uh, and it was a huge success right away. It gave me a lot of time to look back into the future. You know, and hear the call. You know, Mephisto. Mephisto. There's another one that we can bring into my life. Uh, Mephisto was. Uh, he was great with me, also. Let me talk about him in just a second. But one other question on the Purple Haze. You'd been in Florida probably seven or eight years before, mid seventies. Oh yeah. Um, very successful, but again, as a for the most part clean cut yeah, southern against Harley Race and all of them southern heavyweight champion. Yeah. Yeah. When a wrestler goes from one persona to a totally dramatic opposite persona in the same territory like that, within the within the the minds of most fans, is there any problem doing that? Do you have any hurdles to encounter? Know. There was no hurdles. There was no hurdles. Because uh, I live, I live the parts, you know. Like uh, Tom Ernesto came up to me in uh, in uh, Atlanta. He said, "This is amazing." He said, "This is unbelievable." He said, uh, "The last time you were here, you were putting people to sleep. They were running up to be put to sleep because they wanted to prove to everybody it wasn't a stranglehold." You were the biggest baby face, uh, this and that, and uh, now you're uh, you're jumping on Abdullah the butcher, and uh, he's the baby face. Unbelievable. Anybody who can make Abdullah the baby face, 
has accomplished a major task. Uh, correct. Correct. Did you like working one style? Because I'm believable. Yeah. I'm believable because I am the Purple Haze, and I am the maniac, and I'm the guy that uh, delivers brownies, you know. Maybe that all answer, of these personalities. That answers my question. Did you enjoy being a baby face or, or a heel? You were what you were at the time. That yeah, was, that yeah, was Mark course. Lewin. Mark Lewin. I'm still Mark Lewin, no matter what. You know, I'm never going to deny my mother and father. I, they, uh, My father always, no matter what, he was a great guy. So I, He died... Uh, devastated me. But anyway, he took story. care of him at the end of his life. He was with me. Yeah, he died in he died in Tokyo out there with uh when I was out there with Bruiser Brody wrestling him in uh, Japan there and Jai Baba and all of that. Yeah. I think Gary Hart told me one time you'd taken him up up uh, Mount Fuji. Correct. Yeah. They gave him a, cer a ceremony uh uh I guess I can Say this: the, the um, I had some friends that uh, let's call them nightclub owners rather than anything else. Uh, they gave them a five thousand year uh, old uh, uh, send off. You know, they took them up uh, and uh, they cremated them and uh, uh, used chopsticks uh, to take them out. You know, and put them in the, the urn. And they take you through the streets. It's a five thousand year old uh, ceremony, and they took them all through the streets with me. And it was quite. Uh, I gotta say, no more. I don't got the goes to my my Nihon friends. Uh, I appreciate very much uh, if they get wind of this uh, this conversation. I appreciate them very much sending my father. You know, in the ceremony and. Uh, they, uh, they're Yakuza people, but they're 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 great, and uh, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Well, it's been a heck of a ride, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Right to right to now, even even today, it, uh, I'm ready in any respect uh, to get back into any kind of. Uh, I love the business. That's why I'm ready to get back into the business full swing. I'm in no way trying to. Uh, trying to do anything but good to the wrestling business. Yeah. Well, there's still so much untapped wisdom out there. You, you mentioned Frankie Kane, the great Mephisto, who, who has forgotten more about wrestling than we we'll ever know. Correct. Um, yourself, and you look at the wealth of experiences over the years, and you say... And hey, why haven't they taken advantage yeah. of this? Well, I, I, my answer to you is they've taken advantage of... 99.9% of everyone I know. And I'd say I've tried uh, in every respect to uh, and it's not that I've given up, it's that there was <laughs> nowhere else to nowhere else to uh, I mean, strong arm, begging. <laughs> it wouldn't. It doesn't matter, you know. Like if somebody doesn't want to do something, they don't want to do something, you know. Like uh, if you hear an excuse, well, my dad told me not to do it. Well, uh, they've done so many things their dad told them not to do anyway that it would be preposterous, and I've done nothing to make anybody say no to me in any respect because I've done so much for wrestling. I mean, can't you see that? But anyway, it's, uh, I'm still happy, you know, like, I'm not on a, a down trip, I, but I'd love to be, I, I'd love to uh, pass it on. There's so much to pass on. You know, it's like that, uh, what's that story about them riding up to this old man that's uh, putting stones uh, across the uh, river, you know? And he said, old oh, man, uh, why are you, why are you, uh, 
why are you building this bridge across the river? And said, to make the way more easy for you. It's just that simple. Sorry about that. That's okay. Okay, go in. Tell us real quickly, Mark, at the at the end, what you've been doing in the last few years. We had your wife in here earlier, mm -hmm. and, and she's a princess, and I think we can use a capital P with that. Thank you. Yes. Appreciate that. Yeah. Well, uh, I met the princess about, uh, I guess it's uh, about 25 years ago in, uh, in Singapore. I was uh, wrestling there, and she was in the royal box, and I... Uh, We had eye contact, and uh, <clears throat> I uh, asked for uh, I asked for an interview with her, but there was uh, they was they stiffed me a bit there, you know. They, although she was a guest, you know, but uh, she stiffed me a bit there, and so uh, I sent uh, flowers and a courier over there. And, And from that moment on, uh, it changed my life. I I left everything else behind, uh, everything. Uh, my contact with uh, with uh, even like my brother Tad, we mentioned him. I love growing up with my brother Tad, and he he's a wonderful. My brother Don, I admired him. My brother's in the Marine Corps, you know, was on my T-shirt when he was in WW2, you know. Uh, but I lost contact with uh, everyone. I just uh, went, uh, I, I'd say I went Asian, you know. I, I was so much in love with my wife, it, and uh, it was all worth it to be, uh, like I told you about, uh, the Habibi family there, they uh, they took me in, and uh, it's been just uh, the closest thing to uh, paradise, you know. Uh, I'm a lucky man in that respect, so I have uh, no regrets on anything. And like I said, I do it all over again, but uh, she's been uh, everything to me. I spent my uh, last 25 years just uh, making ourselves happy, a bit of a, we're a bit of island hoppers. We like that we've been all over. She's been everywhere, and it makes it so much easier because she's. Uh, people want to be around her. You know what I mean? She's such a. She's such a. If you hear her laugh in the distance, you know you say, "Well, this, this is somebody that." that she has that in Dolce Vita, you know what I mean? It sounds like she is my Movita. She is my life. It know? sounds like the maniac does not go yeet yeet around her. Is that? Well, <laughs> I have my moments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have my moments. Yeah, behind behind closed doors, uh, she's everything. Yeah, and uh, I hope to introduce her to the world. You know. Uh, I have in uh, Australia. She was a super head over there. I went back wrestling over there. I took her on the sports program there, and and uh, we had an open type interview like this, and uh, she was an overnight sensation. You know, it's the it's like the uh, Jay Leno show over there. You know, it's really watched. So she, I was running around princesses, princess that you know. And, and she liked it, you know. She likes it. She, she likes the. Uh, she liked to get out there. You know? Well, Mark. Unfortunately, every once in a while, there's a time limit. You used to yeah. go sixty minute Broadways, and yeah. so are we. We yeah. could. We That's barely right. scratched the surface here, but yeah. we want to thank yeah. you for sharing your thoughts oh, with us. It's been my pleasure, and I, I hope that I have opened up some eyes in the in the wrestling business to the to uh, to make it. Uh, a better business. It's a great business anyway, and it's a success, and uh, I'm glad to have been part of it. Well, we thank Mark Lewin for joining us, and we thank you for watching this as well, and we invite you all to keep an eye on HighSpots.com for the next in our series of interviews with some of the great legends of professional wrestling. So long.